I'm Kelly. I'm the author of Build Your Dream Network. I'm also an angel investor and limited partner uh, in a couple of emerging tech funds. And today we're going to be talking about startups and how your networks are your most important asset and how you're screwing up, how you're uh, connecting with them. I literally was just sitting here as we were waiting to get started, kind of flipping through the book. And like the first page that I opened to, the first sentence said, Networking needs a rebranding. I was like, yes, I'm in. I'm in. So let's start there. Um, with why don't you tell us what uh, networking is? Like, what are we even here to talk about? Um, and what do you mean by that sort of rebranding in terms of what's your definition of it versus like what definition might, might we all be having in our minds right now? Well, I mean, as soon as you hear the word, you've got a picture in your mind of what it is, and we go to that place of oh my God, I'm balancing a glass of wine, something on a small plate, I'm trying to make awkward conversation, you know. Well, I live in New York now, so we can't talk politics, because you can't even bring that up, because that's going to be a problem. So, I mean, the whole, we, we go to that place, we think, how are we going to make small talk? How am I going to work a room? And I want, you to, I want you to completely put that to the side. There is networking as an activity, there's networking as a mindset, and there's networking as a process. And there's those three pieces I want you to think about. To get the networking as an activity, which for me is always my, my last thing I think about, um, networking as an activity to me is every single human interaction. It was your decision to be here today. It's your decision to tell other people that you were coming, maybe to share that information. Maybe it's your voicemail message that you left to say why you're not in the office. Well, some of you are taking notes. Some of you may be on social media saying that you were here. That, to me, is all networking. So your business card, your headshot, your, your bio uh, that you have on your own website, or perhaps the bio you've given to somebody else for, I don't know, a board you're on to read out an event like this, that's all networking. So on a daily basis, you have more chances to connect and engage with people in more meaningful ways than worrying about how you're going to work a room and balance a glass of wine and not have a piece of food in your mouth when someone makes an introduction. So that's what I think in terms of networking as an activity. Networking is a mindset, hey, guess what? I don't care if it's a digital age. It's the same old rules. It's, it's you know, are you a generous human being? Are you someone who listens? Someone uh, I asked who found the book really meaningful, I said, well, what part of the book was most meaningful to you? Because I have my own ideas. You tell me what you found valuable. And they came back to me and they said, the part in the book where you said, network like the person you'd like to network with. And I'm thinking, that's a really short book, if that's really what was all it was about. <laughs> like, a lot less than 50,000 words. But joking aside, it's like, OK, that essentially means be a decent human being. So when you think about networking, like, how are you being a decent human being? How are you being someone who other people want to talk to or that you'd like to talk to again? Because that's what networking is. It's re building relationships as opposed to a transaction, thanks for you know, the liter of milk and the loaf of bread at the grocery store. Like, how do you build that relationship? But more importantly, in terms of my definition of networking, the way I think about it is, as a process and a, and, 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 and a process is something you do by planning, thinking critically, um, problem solving. So think about what's your goal, what's your ambition? What's the challenges you're facing with your company or your startup right now since we're at Volta Labs and we're with startups and probably small business owners, maybe people who are thinking about doing that. Where are you headed? I mean, I don't know many people who take a road trip without a map and a plan. Now, we may take detours. We may be open-minded to test and try new things or take a different route. But we have some idea where we're going. When you're thinking about networking, do the same thing. Think about where you're headed. Who are the people who can help you? Now, how do I connect with them? Am I connecting with them on Twitter or at a cocktail party? Is it an email or is it a text? Mm -hmm. That's where the activity comes mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. So for the startup community in particular, and thinking, like you said, um, small business owners and whatnot, 
how do we kind of define, like, how do we know if we're being a successful networker, essentially? Like, if we embrace sort of what you're saying, embrace your definition, and we set out trying to um, pursue that kind of mindset and definition, how will we know that it's, like, working or we're doing a good <laughs> job? Well, I mean, the, I mean, the first thing I would do is, because all of a sudden, you, you start thinking about networking that way, it shouldn't be this scary, frightening thing that you have to go out and do, because you're already doing it. What you've got to do is take a look at your existing activities. You know, is your is your LinkedIn profile, you know, working for you? What about your website? I'm glad you're involved in the community, but are the community events and the and uh, I want to say maybe the committees or things you're involved in are they really are you are you positioning yourself in them in the right way? Um, are you committing and present enough fully that you're getting, you know, I want to say your full business impact out of it? So in terms of, hey, are you having any results? I'd say, first of all, take a big step back. Look at what you're already doing. Take a full audit. I want from your business card to your voicemail, everything. Hmm. You're dropping your kids off at daycare? Guess what? That's networking. Do you know who the other parents are? What about, you know, in your community? Like, take a look at all of that and say, does everywhere where I'm, I'm connecting with other people, they, do they know, do I know what they're doing in their lives? Do they know what I'm doing in a way that we can help each other out with respect to our businesses or, or other pursuits? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, because one of the immediate kind of like stuck points um, that come to mind for me is this point that you're kind of getting at, which is like the volume of options, right? basically. Right. So I'm thinking especially, and I know you talk about kind of this idea of there's everything from physical world stuff to online stuff, like there's just um, in the world that we work in so many options for like taking an opportunity and turning it in, thinking of it more as a relationship kind of opportunity. Right. Um, but how do you not get overwhelmed by that and sort of really think about like, or, or even get better at letting things go. Because I know there's probably a lot of people in here kind of feel like, well, I actually want to do like 75 of those right. things. Right. But like maybe you can't. So that's when you go back to, when I go back to like what's networking as, as a starting point. It's what's your goal? What is it that you're trying to achieve right now? Create a filter for yourself based on what it is you're trying to achieve. Because that's the one thing, I, I always joke, and I was in San Francisco last week, and I did tease them. I'm like, you're hacking everything in Silicon Valley, but you haven't been able to hack more hours in a day. We can't do everything. And you're right, between networking online, networking offline, you know, social media platforms, meetups, you know, just the proliferation online and offline, mm -hmm. where do you spend your time? And you and you can have people who are really well intended say to you, oh my God, you should attend this, it's really great. If you don't have your own filter that you can say to someone, tell me why it's great. Where are you getting meaning from that co-working space, that meetup, that social media platform, that conference, whatever it may be, unless you can ask those questions and then put it through to say, right, how does this fit within what's going on with me right now? Does it help my business? Do I have the time to commit? Can I participate in the same way? If I don't participate in the same way, will I get the same value? Until you kind of put that through your own filter, you know, you're, you're going to get whipsawed back and forth in, in 12 directions and have a full calendar and not much to show for it beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us an example of um, like some kind of scenario or anecdote where like you've made a decision like that? Or how you kind of like even learned to do this for yourself? Like I'm thinking, you know, you kind of have many, your own. many. Ma <laughs> You're getting <laughs> benefit of my hindsight. <laughs> well, I'm still. Right. Well, so let me just pause and say this. So you write a book on networking, that's filled with a bunch of advice. Guess what you have to do in your life? You have to follow the advice. So everything I'm telling you, like I have to eat my own dog food. Like so, like. Please, like the number of times with, with having the book out where people have made suggestions to me to say, hey, you know what you could do? And I'm like, hey, I can't because I tell people not to do that in the book. Right. So I can't buy followers on Twitter. <laughs> not a good idea because I think that's really a bad idea. And I say so at page whatever I say it on. So 
I have to follow, um, you know, my own advice. So let me give you a, an example where people probably thought I was pretty distracted in my networking. And that's when I, I really got involved with the New York startup community. And late 2011, with a couple other women, had this crazy, wacky idea to start a startup accelerator that would focus on investing in um, mobile or mobile-first companies that had gender diverse founding teams. And we were the first one who kind of made that, you know, kind of spike in the ground that way. But we needed to decide whether or not this was a good idea. Like, what was there an appetite in the market, which sounds crazy to say it, but was there an appetite in the market? Would, would female founders want this? Uh, would other people invest their time or their money, uh, reputation on us to do this? Mm. And so for a period of probably four or five months, I was going to two, three, four, five events a night, running around, meetings all day in the New York startup community. I must have looked like, I don't know what, you know, someone who enjoyed networking, not. <laughs> um, so the reason to do that was, one, I was finding out information. Two, I was not that embedded in the New York startup community at the time. So part of it for me was, do I want to be with these people? Do right. I want to do this? Is this where I now want to invest the next part of my career? So there was that element of it. And then also understanding, all right, if we move forward with this idea, who are the people and who are the places out of, you know, New York City is, you know, the home of meetup um, and where it all launched. It's like out of all those meetups and other groups and things, you know, which ones going forward do I need to really spend my time in? Mm -hmm. So having that why in that direction makes it sort of understandable why, you know, why the heck I was running around, you know, trying to make a multitude of events every single night plus everything else. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you get to the point of being so passionate about this topic that you wanted to write a book about it? All right, so since we're, like we're, since we're in a, you know, <laughs> we're in an innovation center yeah. and around startups, I'll, I'll speak like a startup. I just, you know, solve my own problems. Mm -hmm. My pain point was everyone was seeking this advice from me and wanting to go for coffee dates. Mm -hmm. First problem is I don't drink coffee. Second of all, there's only so many hours in a day where you people can pick your brain over a cup of coffee. And it was like, why, where do you put the advice in one place? And so I had started to blog. I had started to do public speaking. And it was, whether it was a Wall Street executive who had been, um, I want to say, out, you know, done out, doing outplacement, who had been laid off, whether it was a startup founder, whether it was someone earlier in their career, on this questions of how they were problem solving their business, their career, their next career, it was all coming down to networking and I was finally mm -hmm. like, I, I need to put this in one place. Mm -hmm. um, can we yes, and I still get emails where people want to pick my brain. I was brain. just going to say, can we just talk about the pick your brain, please? Oh my God, moment? please, don't, never. Because like, is everyone, first of all, like everyone in this room is probably guilty of asking for that, but also has given that, I feel like, I. It's just so common, that whole, just like, can we just go for coffee? I want to pick your brain about something. And it's always, yeah, like I, you're react. Okay, I don't even need to keep talking. Give, tell us how you feel about that. Because, because, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Listen, you have two things in life. Your two greatest assets. Time and reputation. Mm -hmm. And you've got to choose and pick your time and how you give your time and how you ask for time carefully because you can never get it back and you can never give it back to someone else. As for mm -hmm. reputation, you know what? That's earned, but sometimes you can get that back. And you know, those of us who are old enough in the room to remember Michael Milken went from junk bond king of Wall Street to being Michael Milken, you know, prisoner number whatever. He was, you know, convicted on federal charges and did time in a penitentiary. And now most people know him as the Milken Institute. Oh, and, and there's never, I, I can't think of anyone else who's had a sort of a reputation that went from, you know, sort of the phoenix rising from the gutter. Um, <laughs> really nothing much more you can say about it. But, you know, you, 
in terms of when you're asking someone to pick their brain, you're taking their time and you're diminishing the value of your own reputation as, as devaluing their expertise, which is what, upon which their reputation is based. So what's a better thing to do? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, do your research. I mean, we've already been talking about it in terms of, hey, you know, you share a blog, you write a book, you do a podcast. If you haven't done a deep dive of the research of why you want to talk to that person, and I'm not meaning in a, hey, you've had an interesting career, show that you've really done the research and ask a better question. Mm -hmm. And if you can say to someone, I'm really interested in how you scaled your company from you know, a million dollars to 10 million, because only this many companies do that. And from what I've seen, you did it in a period of about 13 months. And I know at that point in time, the economy really sucked. And you have this really consumer-driven company. I'm really intrigued how the heck you did that. Hmm. Like, ask a better question. Someone is going to give you the time if you've done the research. Mm -hmm. But the, hey, you're an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. I'd really love to pick your brain on how you built your company. It's like, we all want to roll our eyes back in our head on that one. Mm -hmm. So don't ask mm -hmm. that question. Mm -hmm. Do the research. Spend more time. I want to say preparing for that networking activity. So I, analogy I like to do, and since I'm in Canada, I get to do it with a metric stick as opposed to a yard stick. But <laughs> let's take that, you know, a length of string, and you think about networking as this distance. Most people spend about, mm, I don't know, I'll be generous, a centimeter, <laughs> an inch planning their networking, and then they're running around. What I'm asking you to do is flip it the other way. Hmm. Do more research. Use more of the resources and the tools that are out there because people are leaving information everywhere. Whether it's sitting here in, a, in an event live or watching it on YouTube, whether it is that podcast, that blog, I mean, venture capitalists aren't writing blogs for their own well-being. They're sharing information because they can't sit there for coffee dates. Take all of that in now. Target the person or the group of people and target and ask a better question. You're going to get better results than sort of this spray and pray and see who actually you know, picks the ball up for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you give us a few other examples of, um, and you've mentioned them throughout so far, but this idea of like other than parties where you're holding a small plate um, or, you know, events even like this, which seem like pretty obvious because there'll be, there's opportunities to kind of talk with a group mm -hmm. of people. Like what are some other um, opportunities that we should be thinking about or that we're sort of likely to be overlooking right now and not thinking of as networking opportunities when really they could be sort of these gems? Yeah, I think people forget, first and foremost, they forget their own network. And I think in, in mm -hmm. when we're in startups, and, and I would say, you know, a lot of times with, with um, business owners, entrepreneurs, we always think it's somebody else. Crowdfunding, brilliant example on this. We always think there's mm -hmm. like some stranger, some unknown person who is going to help us. And the fact of the matter is, whatever you do starts with your own network. And if you look and say, well, I don't have everyone I need in my network. Well, now you know what you got to do. You got to start expanding that part of your network. But we overlook who's immediately in our network, mm -hmm. and we forget that they also have networks behind them. So, you know, you may be saying, and I'll use an example from recently from my own life. You may say, well, you know. I need to reach, I need PR and I need to reach some journalists with what I've got going on and I don't know anyone. Well, you're forgetting your network may know someone. Mm -hmm. And a piece that came out that just you know, quoted me with respect to the book happened because a friend who is in um, the wealth management space posted on Facebook about my book, which led immediately to an introduction to a journalist who's her friend who saw that post. And I don't think enough of us kind of go, oh, well, this person and this person. You've got to start with your own core of people. 
the people who know you best are most likely to help you. And if they're not the first line to get you what you need, it might be someone behind them. But start pulling the threads that way rather than thinking a complete and utter stranger is going to come you know, riding into your rescue. Um, is part of the reason why that uh, one of the cases, so the book is case study driven, so it's not all Kelly, 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 which would really bored me to write, let alone asking anybody to read, mm -hmm. and would have been really bad networking on top of that, just to talk about myself. But one of the case studies, so all case study driven, one of the case studies in there is Catherine Finney, um, who has the big accelerator out of Atlanta, and her crowdfunding effort. And most people think crowdfunding is marketing. How can I get a bunch of people who don't know me to give me money? Wrong. Crowdfunding is about networking. Crowdfunding, the platforms, merely facilitate payments, primarily from people you already know. And if you don't look at it as, how do I activate my own network and quickly activate them so that then the marketing, I want to say, piece of a crowdfunding platform kicks in, because until they see you're a success with your own network and your own fundraising activities, they're not going to do a thing. You have to activate your own network. It's like getting your own candidate elected. It's, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, the, the percentage, and it's like ridiculous, of crowdfunding efforts which raise Zippo because people think, oh, I just put up a video and I have a page and strangers are going to come rushing with money. It's not the way it works. What do you say to people who um, would offer the like hesitation or rebuttal around um, feeling like nervous about asking the people they know for too much help too many times? Um, two responses to that. The first is get over it. Uh, <laughs> the second is... If you're hesitating because of your own behavior with your own network, then change your behavior mm -hmm. in this sense that if you haven't been the person who's been helpful within your own networks, if you don't feel you can ask your own network for help because you've never given them assistance, yeah. you know what? Change your behavior because, you know, that's it. If you can't ask your network for help because you haven't been there for them, you pr have a pretty, you know, low return on generosity. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not investing in your own network and in the people around you, um, whether that's the co-working space, you know, former colleagues, and some of this because of, I want to say, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or, um, you know, a holiday card list, whatever it may be, there's just tiny random acts of human kindness is all it takes. It doesn't take, you know, necessarily having to, you know, donate a day to, you know, clean out someone's garage or whatever the, 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 the act is, right? <laughs> it could be reviewing someone's pitch deck. It could be ta taking 10 minutes and saying, hey, I know you've got that pitch tomorrow, oh, for the Atlantic Venture Forum or you know, whatever it may be, if you want to try it out on me, you know, I'm happy to hear it and I'll, I'll time you. Like, whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be that much. Mm -hmm. But if you can't ask your own network, but I know a lot of us, and uh, there is a hesitancy in sometimes with respect to business in terms of asking close friends. But if your close friends don't want to help you succeed or buy your service or your products, well, you know, you've got a bitter is bigger issue here. Mm -hmm on that vein here from people who sort of feel like they have to like wait until they have like just the kind of like the right ask or like a bigger ask you know like sort of that idea of like well okay I'm thinking about who I have relationships with okay these people I can ask for this these people I should hold out and wait until I have something more important to ask them for like is there any of that kind of well I think part I think I think what you're getting to is is I think sometimes we have that dynamic because you know, when I go back where I started with networking, there still is this aspect of networking generosity. Mm -hmm. And we often hear, you, have, you know, you have to the give before, you know, the get kind of thing. And so when you sort of, some of this feels to me like the networking imbalance. Mm. 
Like, right. yes, like I'm here, I'm just, you know, like I think of often this with like interns, I'm the lowly intern and this is someone higher up, how do I ask them? Right. That's where I get back to time and reputation and doing your research mm -hmm. and being considerate and asking in the right way for something that someone can do and showing that you have thought through why they are the right person to make the ask of understanding things from their perspective you know sort of this is like this is also where you like take in all the social data points like sometimes mm -hmm. someone will ask me to say hey could you pitch so and so and I'm like I could but not right now here's why you're not prepared on this with your information or hey I know they're getting married next weekend and this is just going to get lost or they've got their big conference next week so this is not the time you mm -hmm. know like circle back with me at the end of the month take in those other data points knowing that listen you've got urgencies and important things in your life so do they you know something might have happened on over the weekend to you that derailed everything that was going that you had planned to get done guess what could have happened to them as well so insert that you know I want to say that, that human decency mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and think about, all right, my life is messy and complicated. My guess is theirs is too. How can I make it easier for them to help me? Maybe it's by recognizing where and what I'm doing is either a considerate ask because I planned this out or where it's in their interest as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in your experience, how does this kind of way of thinking about our relationships um, help when we're thinking about investment or looking to connect with potential investors and sort of grow our network in that way? I love that question. I, <laughs> I get too many in my, I'm going to say, investor, VC friends, the same thing. Mm -hmm. They get too many emails that includes, you know, it's like a first time they've heard from the person. So it's basically cold calling. It's got a pitch deck attached, uh, and it's uh, you know got a deadline of when uh, you know the investor has to make a decision, mm. uh, and it thinks of investors like ATM machines as opposed to a relationship. The reality is, with rare exception. Investors make investments in people they know and that have come through their networks. And a cold email and a one-time meeting isn't it. So at an early stage, I mean, we're, it, you hate, the startups hate this. We invest in people. Why do we invest in people? Because markets and ideas and products change. People don't. So a one-time meeting, a 15-minute coffee, a seeing you for five minutes on stage at a pitch event, I don't know you. Now, if you've come through my network because somebody else hmm. has known you for years and mentored you, maybe they were your teacher at school, maybe they worked with you before, hmm. they were your boss, they come to me and say, hey, there's something you should look at. I'm going to listen because now I've got this trusted relationship. When a startup founder I've previously invested in comes to me and says, my buddy from college or this person I've been working alongside in the you know, co-working space for the past year, they're working on something really cool. Would you talk to them? I really like what they're doing. Hmm. Okay, I've invested in this person before. I trust their judgment. I mean, one of the things in terms of networking to get to investors that... that um, Founders overlook, startups overlook, is one, the relationship with their peers. That's probably more important than, you know, running up to investors. So getting to know your peers and, and building a strong relationship with them because that's the community, particularly getting to know the people who have received some level of funding and understanding and, and you know, they're the, you're, they're your best source for mentoring and a whole lot of advice. But um, they're the ones that I think a lot of times investors put the most credence in, in terms of an idea of who they want to 
meet and invest and per potentially get to know and maybe invest in, in, in some point. So getting to know your peers, and then if you're if you are going to say right, I got to really build and under relationships with and understand venture firms to understand if they are the right firm who wants to work with me. Um, you know, you don't go running up to the head honcho. It's, you know, you've got to find the analysts and the associates at those firms. Because the only way venture scales is you have a bunch of young people with a whole lot more energy and enthusiasm and stamina to run around all those startup events that all of us can't <laughs> attend, but somebody from the firm's got to go there. They're your gatekeeper. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny for me, it's like I started my career as a lawyer, and you know, the number of people who you know, bypass the receptionists and the secretaries thinking they were going to get to the corner partner, big mistake. Mm -hmm. you know, those gatekeepers are probably your, you know, the relationships you should be building, not worrying you know, whether or not you know, the name partner on the door you know, is talking to you because the only way it's going to get on his or her desk is through one of those gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. Oh, I could go on this topic for hours. <laughs> but, you, but the main thing you've hit on in, in the way you asked the question is that you've got to build the relationship. Mm -hmm. The building of a relationship with an investor doesn't start with, I'm closing a round in a month, or I need to close this round in the next three months. That may happen if you already know those people. So if, you're, if this is day one of your startup, you've got an idea, that's when you start building the relationships. You may not intend to ever start your fundraising activities for three years. That's when you start the relationships. Not, I need to close this round by September 1. Because it's not going to happen, unless you already know those people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to make sure we have lots of time for you guys to ask questions that are important to you. Um, I'll just plant one more seed before we do that. Because um, I want to make sure everything that you're talking about connects with any of the introverts in the room. Um, <laughs> you know, you're saving my favorite question for last. <laughs> well, and I am one also, so selfishly, I'm like, we have to make sure we get there because if anyone else is in the audience wondering these same things, like, we have to make that connect. So, um, so not to say, obviously, that introverts don't also love people. Um, we do, and, you know, love building relationships and spending time with people, but those sort of like hesitations or barriers around like hating small talk or finding um, spending time in groups of people to be draining. So then that whole idea of like there's a finite amount of time and energy um, presumably available that we have to kind of manage um, can feel make kind of the idea of managing many more relationships feel quite daunting. So what advice um, do you have for introverts or how do you kind of turn your your content into making it very introvert friendly? Um, so I mentioned earlier that the book is case study driven. Right. So the, whether that is crowdfunding, working up the corporate ladder, landing on a board, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And in doing the detailed outline for the book, I'd set out what I wanted for the case studies. And then I thought about who I wanted to be the case study, to unpack their story, mm -hmm. walk through it so someone else could say, boom, I can do this. And I sent out the interviews to these people and I started getting the answers back and I can't tell you when, at what point, I was I substantially all the interviews in and then it finally hit me and I called one of the um, interviewers because one question I didn't ask anyone was, what's your personality type? Mm. How'd you do on Myers-Briggs? Did not, one of the questions. And so I called, it was, actually it was Aiden, um, Aiden Donnelly Rowley, a, um, author, novelist, um, and I called her. And I said, Aiden, I didn't ask you this question, but I, I be getting my answers back, and I'm hearing this a lot. Would you happen to be an introvert as well? And she's like, hell yeah. Most of the people I interviewed in the book, unbeknownst to me, are introverts. Okay. And in some cases, profoundly so. You hinted at it with the answer, with your question in the... We're deluged with options. Mm -hmm. We're uncomfortable. Um, introverts, I believe, are the best networkers right now for exactly those reasons. Mm. 
There's so many options and opportunities. You are much more deliberate and focused and considerate because you're likely managing your own discomfort with this notion, this, I'm going to say in many ways, this the old-fashioned notion of networking. But in a day and age when we are so bombarded, that approach, I think, makes you much more targeted and focused in a humane and kind way that makes you a better networker. So for the introverts in the room, I, I mean, my first piece of advice, I usually am quite flippant on it. I'm like, my first piece of advice is when someone sends you an article that tells you how you can network like an extrovert, I want you to hit delete. <laughs> don't touch it. Don't read it. <laughs> don't change who you are. Understand that in managing your own, you know what you need to do, so you manage your discomfort by being purposeful and intentional. And understand that actually the world needs more of that. There's going to be times when you have to get out of your own, I want to say, your own head and say, right, I have to go there. You say, like, I'm an introvert, but you're sitting here doing all of this. You know, you're like, okay, I'm an, I'm an introvert, but I also have a career that needs to be forward facing. Therefore, how do I pick and choose the events, the opportunities that are going to be forward facing in a meaningful way for me? That goes back to having your goal. Where are you headed? Um, I'm not an extrovert. Shocker to many, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I'm an ambivert. So it's one of the things I learned in writing the book. So if you don't know what you are, if you're an extrovert or an introvert or the new category, go to thequietrevolution.com. There's a little test, mm -hmm. tell you what you are. Uh, and that was enlightening for me because people do think I'm this extrovert. But think about yourself. Think about situations where you've walked into a room, maybe like this one, and you've had the life sucked out of you. And then you've walked in that same room, and it looks almost the same, but there's something different, and you're really, like your energy level goes way up. Chances are you're an ambivert. We get our energy from other people. And, and like, pay attention to that. What are the situations where you're feeling more energized versus less? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um... So don't change. <laughs> Don't read those articles that tell you you have to change. <laughs>